Alléluia. Alléluia. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Are you ready for the word this morning? I'm not going to minister long this morning, but I hope that you receive this word. Mr. Howard, when we had our service and our outreach outside on the 1st of December, ministered a salvation message to the people on the greatest gift. I'm going to dovetail on that and call it the perfect gift. The perfect gift. My question is, do you have all your shopping done? I asked somebody that, and they said, no, they're going to start tomorrow. Do you have all your shopping done? There's some folks that are hard to shop for. You ever notice that? Is there anybody in your circle of influence that's hard to shop for? Sometimes some folks just have everything and you don't know what to get. There's those that are picky people. And you're afraid no matter what you get, it might not make them happy. For nobody in this house, but you have no idea what they need or what they want. You don't know what size or what color. You ever been to a place and try to get some clothing for somebody, but you don't know what size? You're not sure what would suit them the best, so you have to leave that out. They're just plain picky, some people. Years ago, I made a mistake. You ever make a real bad mistake on buying a gift? Anybody? Nobody but me, right? I took my dad fishing, and he was really into it. He was really enjoying fishing. And, and it was close to Christmas, and he said, Boy, I would love to take Mom fishing sometime. <laughs> you got it already. I would love to take Mom fishing so I said, well, good, I'm going to help Dad. So I bought my mom a fishing rod and a reel for Christmas. Well, when she opened up that package of rod and reel and she looked at me, I knew I was in deep trouble. <laughs> you can get a lot of people the wrong things to get by with it, but not mom. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Or your wife. <laughs> your wife or mom, you better get it right. Well, I bought my mom a rod and reel, and she didn't talk to me for a whole month. I was absolutely out of her life. My dad worked on her and got her calmed down and kind of took part of the blame for this thing. But sometimes even the perfect gift doesn't turn out to be the perfect gift. Amen? But I got good news for you this morning, and that is God knows exactly what we need. He's never at a loss on what's the perfect gift for us. And what is it that would meet our need? And what is it that would take care of the circumstances of our life? Amen? He knows what the perfect gift is. Just to help us keep our spiritual perspective this morning, in these last days leading up to Christmas, let us be reminded of some of God's gifts to us. I'm going to remind you of some of the gifts that God has given us as we recognize gifts. And probably this afternoon, maybe already this morning, there's been many people under the tree ripping gifts open and already seeing what they got. But let me tell you something. God knows exactly what gift we need. You know why? Because James said every perfect gift comes down for the Father of lights where there's no variables, no shadows of a turning. He knows Every good and perfect gift. God doesn't give gifts that aren't good. He doesn't give gifts that aren't perfect. I'm going to mention a few gifts quickly this morning. Here's the first one, most perfect gift. That's the gift of salvation. That's the gift of a Savior. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Christmas story that we read in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The gift of a Savior. The gift of a Savior. If there ever was a gift where everybody needs one, it's the gift of a Savior. If there ever was a gift that one size fits all, it's the gift of a Savior. 
If there ever was a gift that you can't do without, it's the gift of a Savior. This is the gift. This is the gift. It was promised, this gift was promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. After the fall of Adam and he was put out of the garden and God had to kill an animal to a shedding of blood for the remission of sin and put animal clothes around Adam and Eve. He said to the serpent, the enemy, the devil, he said, because you caused this fall, he said, the woman's seed is going to come and bruise your head. And the woman's seed's heel will be bruised. How many of you know a heel bruise hurts a lot, but you can live with it? How many of you know a head bruise is fatal? Is anybody with me? Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. But the devil's taken a, taken a final blow that he is not going to reign and not have authority. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That was a promise of a gift. It's the perfect timing. His timing is always right. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time has come. Is anybody with me? When the fullness of time. Let me just tell you something about God's timing. He's an on-time God. He may not be there when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. Because he's an on-time God. He's a God that's always on time. But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. The promise that was given, the promise that was told to us, that all down through history that they looked and waited. The devil didn't know who this promised child was. In fact, many times in history, uh, the, uh, the person, uh, the, the one that was in control at the time had babies killed because hoping it would destroy this woman's seed. And even the devil didn't know who this woman's seed was until the day that John the Baptist baptized Jesus and brought him up out of the water. And the Spirit of the Lord came down like a dove. And the heavens opened up and God spoke and said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It was guesswork for the devil until then. Because the work was going to be completed. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Is anybody glad that your sons and your sons and daughters are the most high God? Is anybody excited that God's adopted us and brought us into the household of God, into the family of God? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. So the first gift that we, want, that we are recognizing is the gift of a Savior. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. He came to set the captives free. He came that we might know that he is our God and our Lord forever and ever. Then the second thing I want to mention about the greatest gift, the most perfect gift, is the gift of salvation. The gift of salvation. What would we do if Jesus would have came, but he would have left out salvation for me and you? He came that we might be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. A personal relationship with the living God. I trust that everybody in this house has had a personal relationship with the living God. A personal relationship. Somewhere along the line, you put your hand in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus and made him Lord of your life. Somewhere, somehow, something happened. Somebody spoke to you and told you like, like somebody cared enough about me in my younger years and said, George, hey, you're going down the wrong road. You're a mess. You need Jesus as your Savior. You need a, if you don't let Jesus take over your life, you're going to self-destruct. And I reached out, and I let Jesus take over my life, and I asked him to come into my heart, and I was born again. A personal relationship with the living God. Ephesians chapter 2 
Verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. What does that mean, Pastor? That means you're not earning it? You can't do enough good things to earn your way into the kingdom? Uh, you can't help enough people and give enough things away and, and, and be good enough because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. And that's the reason why we need salvation. The gift of salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of ourselves. It's a gift. Somebody say gift. It's a precious gift. It's a perfect gift. It's a gift from the throne room of God. Not of works. Not of works. Not what we can do. Not what we can muster up, lest anyone should boast about it. No matter how close we are and how many things you do in the house of God, how many things you do in the church, how many Sunday school classes you taught, or how many sermons you preached, we can't go around and say, look at me, what I've done. I am what I am because of who he is. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The gift of salvation. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not only have we been given the gift of a Savior, not only have we been given the gift of salvation, but we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The empowerment that we have through the power of the Holy Spirit. The fact that we can walk, not by might, but not by power, but by thy spirit, saith the Lord. In John chapter 14 and verse 16 and 18, and I will pray the Father, Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. If you're saved, you know him. If you're born again, you know him. If you have a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, then when the Holy Spirit fingers about your heart and speaks to you about things and deals with you and leads you and teaches you, you know him. The scripture says that we know him. But you know him, for he, de for he dwells with you and will be in you. He said, I won't leave you as orphans. I won't leave you disconnected. Or I won't leave you comfortless. Are you with me? But he said, I will come to you. And Jesus told his disciples, remember, they were saved in, in John chapter 20. They were born again. Jesus breathed into them the spirit of salvation. But yet these same disciples that was there and, and Jesus breathed in them the breath of life, of salvation in John chapter 20, these same disciples were those part of the 120 in the upper room, waiting for the promise, waiting for the outpouring, waiting for what he said was going to take place in John 14, that a comforter would come. <clears throat> in fact, he said it like this, tarry in Jerusalem till the Holy Ghost comes upon you that you might be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. This Holy Ghost is something, it, it, it is the third part of the Godhead bodily that empowers us to live this life with victory. <clears throat> We're living in changing times, church. We're living in times where people are complacent, people are uh, lethargic, that people are so caught up in so many other things, cares of this world. That if there was ever a time that we need the empowerment of the Spirit to live in victory, it's this time that we live today. We must, we must, we must receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is an indwelling person. The Spirit of God indwells us, takes up residence within us lives in us and through us. 
You ever wonder why sometimes you're going through things in life and it seems like you almost are, are, are quickened by something inside of you that tells you to do this and then pulls you over to this and you walk your day and you look back and it wasn't the day that you planned, but there were some things that took place that you was led by the Spirit of the living God. Has that ever, ever happened to anybody but me? Anybody know what it is to be led by the Spirit and God guides you and directs you through your day? And you look back and you say, wow, that... The Spirit of the Lord was with me today because he's indwelling. And not only is he the indwelling person, but he's an empowering person. He empowers us. He helps us overcome circumstances. The Scripture says, no temptation is given to man by there is a way of escape. He'll always give you a way out. He'll always guide us and direct us into the right path because he's an empowering person. And then the Holy Spirit is an educating person. How many of you know the scripture says he'll teach us all things? He's our teacher. Do you have an ear tuned to the Spirit to teach you some things sometimes? Is there times that you don't have the answer? You're not sure what to do, but the Holy Spirit will teach us. What a gift. What a gift. And with the gifts of the Holy, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, there's all those gifts of the Spirit that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the impartation, the empowerment, and the anointing of the Spirit of God that rests upon us. What a gift. When Jesus came as a baby in a manger, it wasn't about the baby. It wasn't about a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. It was about the entrance into this world through a virgin that the sin of Adam would not be upon this child because this was the son of the living God. And the purpose was to grow as the conquering king and the savior, almighty God dwelling with us, Emmanuel, God himself with us. Then the fourth gift I'd like to look at for a few moments quickly is the gift of of giving and grace. I said the gift of giving and grace. You know one of the greatest things you can do is learn how to be a giver? You know why? Because God gave all that he had to give. If you hold back sometimes, aren't you glad God doesn't hold back? Aren't you glad when it was time for God to give us grace and give us, uh, give us all that he has and go over to <clears throat> excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1 and find out Ten things that he just gave us because of his love. He forgave us. He empowered us. He anointed us. He blessed us. Are you with me? The gift of giving. Second Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5 says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gifts beforehand which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of graciousness and, and generosity and not as grudgingly and an act of just obedience. God so loved the world that he gave all that he had. And when it comes time for us, church, we ought to give with an attitude of, of God's heart. When we want to share with somebody, give it with the right heart. When we, know, when we want God to move in our life, let our giving be a giving of, of sacrifice and of love. And then I think about the gift of grace, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, that the Gentiles should be follow, fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister, Paul says talking about his beloved brother Titus that he connected with the congregation and told them to receive him. According, this is a good phrase, according to the gift of the grace of God. What would we do without God's grace? What would we do? God's grace is when he overlooks all those things and loves us just the same anyway. God's grace is when he says no matter what you've been through, what you've done, no matter how, time, how many times you've rejected me, how many times you had a bad attitude, my grace is going to overshadow you because I love you just that much. Grace, grace, wonderful grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And 
I was blind. But now I see according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Hallelujah. Anybody can get excited with me about that. I'm going to give you one more. Can I do that? I told you I wasn't going to be long this morning. But we need to talk about the most perfect gift. And that's what we're looking at. The gift according to God's word. And when you open up those gifts today and you share with the ones that loved you and gave you some things that maybe that you really appreciate and you let them know how much you appreciate, don't ever let out the fact that we've got the most perfect gift. God so loved us that he gave the most perfect gift. Here's my last thought this morning. What do you do with a gift? When you get a gift, what do you do with a gift? If it's not a gift you make me like, maybe you keep it and give it to somebody else. Nobody here has ever done that, but you have a gift that you look at it and you say nice and you put it on a shelf somewhere and then six months later, oh, 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 oh yeah, I, I remember that. That was that gift. But you see, what do you do with the gift that was given to us, the most perfect gift? Suppose every parent has had the experience. I think we all as parents, Mickey and I raised five children. and Many of you parents are here with me this morning. Suppose every parent that had an experience of searching for some special gift for their child. We always want the children to have the right things. Amen? We always want to do the best for our children. Sometimes we go the extra mile for that. And then after all the effort seeing the child on Christmas morning, they spend more time playing in the box than they do with the gift. <laughs> that ever happened to any of your kids? I, I really, really gone out of my way to do the best for my kids and make sure that they got what I thought they wanted and the little ones would spend more time in the box that the gift came in. Amen? The feeling you have at that time, the feeling is, what about the gift? What about what I spent so much time trying to make sure I gave you something that you really wanted, and now you're playing in the box? wonder if God thinks that way sometimes about us. The feeling God must have about some of his children and their attitude towards his perfect gift. I wonder if sometimes we are so interested in the box, in the stuff, in the creation of God and things he made available to us that we let those things get in the way while the most perfect gift is sitting aside waiting for our attention. Is, is anybody with me? He's waiting. He's saying, but, 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 but the best gift, but, but I've given you the best gift. But I gave my son. I gave all that I have. And you're all excited about all the other stuff that I created. You're worshiping those things when the greatest gift is my son. He's been set aside because you're playing with the box. So what do we do with the gift? Can I tell you just a couple of things? What should we do with the perfect gift? Number one, thank God for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. I'm not going to read that for you, but write it down and read it later. If we're going to be recognizing the greatest gift, then thank God for it. Thank God for his gift. That's okay, Robert. You put that up. I appreciate it. Thank God for this gift. Here's the next thing. If you're going to appreciate the gift and, quit, and we stop playing in the box and we start dealing with the gift, the greatest gift, perfect gift, then let's use the gift. I said let's use the gift. Let's be a witness about the gift. Let's share with the lost and dying world that this is the greatest gift of all. I heard Michael Youssef this morning ministering on, the, on his, his take of the Christmas story. And here's what he said. He said, I've studied all the other religions. 
all the other main religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Mormonism. He said, I studied them all. He said, there isn't any other religion in the world that's presented the gift that God has given to us. God is the only one to give a perfect gift. And so not only thank God for it, not only use it, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, but then share it. Share the gift. Share the gift. When a gift is good enough, you want everybody to know about it. For Mickey's birthday, she's always wanted a 1959 Ford Galaxy 500. Because she had one when she was younger. Her mom had one. A 59. Not a 58. Not a 57. 59. So on her birthday, I bought her a 1959 Ford Galaxy 500 with the color that she's always wanted. And you know the first thing she wanted to do? She wanted to share it with the people that she loved. She wanted people to come. Hey, would would you like to ride in my 59 Ford Galaxy 500? Hey, could we go down to the, hey, could, could we go down to Steak and Shake and go and have a milkshake and listen to a little 50s music in my 59 Galaxy 500? Uh, it didn't come in a box, and she didn't play with the box. She played with the gift. Is anybody with me? So not only thank God for it, not only use it, not only share it, but here's another thing that we need to do with this gift. We need to add to it. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 8. Add to it. In other words, if it's all that good, then it ought to be other people ought to come and understand and, want the, and be a part of the gift. Are you with me? So we need to be able to make sure, church, that we never forget. Musicians can come. Never forget the greatest gift. There was a man that was in a Christmas parking lot space. It was a week before Christmas. There was a long line and a crowd that was trying to get in, and the parking lot was full, and the store was crowded, and people were rude. You ever been to any other place like that? Pushing and shoving. The checkout line was long, and somebody heard one man say this. They should have killed the guy that started Christmas. Somebody else hollered out and said, they did kill him. And he died on the cross for me and for you. And he loves you. That's what Christmas is all about. Could anybody say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to say to you all, Merry Christmas. We're going to close this service in just a few moments, but I, from the bottom of my heart, Sister Mickey and I love you. And we thank you for coming to the house of God on this special day today. Of all days, this is the time to come. And we're honoring your time, and we know that you got Christmas events to take care of but you came to give the first fruits to him and you're going to have a glorious day today stand with me if you will please